This is my great uncle, Kurt. Growing up, I idolized him. He was a woodcarver, he wore suspenders, <laughs> and he was a ventriloquist, which I was able to look past. <laughs> because I found that terrifying. <laughs> Kurt embraced life, and he was many things, including an artist, despite the fact that he was colorblind. And when I was in kindergarten, I was given an opportunity to be an artist just like Kurt. Each student in my class was assigned to write and illustrate a page in a class book titled, As Red As A Blank. And you could film whatever you wanted. So some students created pages that said, as red as an apple or as red as a fire truck. But I made a page that said, as red as a pickle. And my teacher called my parents and said, <laughs> we have to talk about Brian. <laughs> so I was given tests. Tests where these colored dots were organized into circles. And by differentiating between the colors of those dots, the viewer should be able to see all sorts of shapes and numbers hidden in their patterns. But I couldn't see any. Because it turns out that just like Uncle Kurt and 250 million other people worldwide, I'm colorblind. My grandmother, Kurt's sister, was a carrier for colorblindness. She passed this trait along to my mom, who passed it along to me. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> and while there are many variations, the standard human genetic makeup is 23 pairs of chromosomes, and that 23rd pair determines sex. So if that final pair is XX, that person is female. If it's XY, that person is male. And the genes for the most common form of colorblindness, the form I have, are found on the X chromosome of that 23rd pair. So if a female has those genes on one of her X chromosomes, she won't be colorblind. She'll just be a carrier for the trait, like my grandmother and like my mom. This is because her other X chromosome covers everything up. In order for her to have my form of colorblindness, she would need those genes on both of her X chromosomes, which is less likely to occur. But for a male to have my form of colorblindness, he would only need those genes on his single X chromosome. Those genes have nowhere to hide. There's nothing to cover them up. And because of this, colorblindness is far more prominent among males. In fact, it's estimated that one in 12 males has some degree of colorblindness. Whereas for females, that number is closer to one in 200. Now, I am aware that as far as biological deficiencies are concerned, that colorblindness isn't a serious problem, but it still causes issues. When I was in grade school, <laughs> when I was in grade school, I used to just read the names written on crayons so I could know what color I was using. But that tactic went out the window, and I became lost when Crayola decided to introduce a bunch of fun new colors. <laughs> colors like Timberwolf. <laughs> and Tumbleweed. And Razzmatazz. I still don't know what Razzmatazz is, and I don't think anyone does. And today, I have to grovel before the sales associate at the department store to help me pick out clothing that actually matches. What I'm wearing right now took an entire team of professionals to assemble. <laughs> Apparently, these pants are burgundy. <laughs> which I'm told is quite bold and... <laughs> quite stylish, so... You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> but I have other issues, too. I never know when I have to put on more sunscreen. I struggle picking out produce that's ripe. I have a hard time telling when meat is properly cooked, so I just play it safe, and I burn everything. <laughs> Growing up, my friends thought all of this was hilarious. They used to circulate messages hidden inside of colorblind tests right in front of me, like this one. 
I always thought they were being supportive. And whenever anyone learns that I'm colorblind, they don't ask about my lineage. They don't ask about my struggles. They ask one question that every single colorblind person has heard over and over again. Without fail, it's always, you're colorblind? Well, then what color is this? <laughs> and they, they point to something, like it's, like it's some sort of party trick. <laughs> and I understand, they're just curious. But to be fair, this is like the only example I can think of where some sort of deficiency causes the need for public verification. <laughs> Case in point, if someone were to say they were allergic to nuts, no one would slide them a bowl of trail mix. <laughs> <laughs> say, oh, you're allergic? Show me. swell up a little bit. <laughs> the common perception is that I only see in black and white. And while that's true for some colorblind people, it's extremely rare. Most colorblind people, myself included, simply have a hard time differentiating between colors. To me, green looks like a reddish or a brownish. Blue looks similar to purple and pink. I can narrow down the possibilities as to what color something is, but I can't say for sure. So if you were to show me a green shirt, I might think it's brown, but I know that it wasn't blue. To me, these two images are identical. Now, before all of you with your standard vision <laughs> start to feel high and mighty, <laughs> consider the discrepancies in how all of us perceive color. You'll likely agree that the screen behind me is green but you're only agreeing on the word you're using to identify this color. Your perspective is your own. You haven't seen through anyone else's eyes. No one has. So we can't say for certain that what you're seeing is the exact shade and hue that your neighbor is seeing. You're just using the word that you associate with what's behind me. And this association is learned. It's conveyed through language. Language which can actually impact how we perceive color. Western languages divide color into 11 different categories, red, orange, blue, gray, etc. But members of the Himba tribe in northern Namibia, they only divide color into five categories. They lump colors together. To them, red and orange and brown are all considered the same thing. And because of this, it's hard for them to differentiate between those colors. They don't have the language to do so. On the other hand, however, the Himba have developed such in-depth terms for shades of green that they're able to observe and articulate subtleties in that category of color that people outside their tribe can't. And color permeates so many languages, including English. Think about it. Something can come right out of the blue, make us green with envy. We can be tickled pink <laughs> or red in the face. Someone can be seen as a black sheep or as having a yellow streak. We can wave the white flag in defeat, or we can succeed with flying colors. But without language to serve as a framework for color, how would we be able to make sense of our own unique interpretations of it? The retinal cone cells in our eyes respond to wavelengths of light reflected from different colored objects. They then pass that information along to our brains. So when someone with standard vision sees different colors, their cones are stimulated in specific ratios. This creates a unique response, a message that says, this is red or this is green. But when I see different colors, my cones aren't stimulated in those same ratios. There's not a unique response for different colors. So regardless of whether I'm looking at something that's red or green, that same message is sent to my brain. And that's why those colors look similar to me. But recently, technological advancements were made in correcting colorblindness. Special glasses were invented that filter out the wavelengths of light that cause these same messages to be sent to the brains of colorblind people when viewing different colors. These glasses essentially help colorblind people to differentiate between colors. And maybe you've seen these glasses featured in videos on your social media feeds. They usually show some colorblind person skeptically putting on the glasses for the first time. 
and then breaking down into tears of joy. <laughs> People send me links to those videos all the time. And the first time I saw one of those videos, I freaked out with excitement and I drove seven hours to the company's facilities so I could try on the glasses for myself. I was ecstatic. I was ecstatic because the grass was literally going to be greener on the other side. <laughs> Come on, right? And so, eventually, I arrived. And my tour guide led me outdoors so I could try on the glasses in this garden that was full of all these flowers and bloom. And she did this because she, quote, wanted my first time to be special. <laughs> and so, trembling, I put on the glasses, and I opened my eyes, and there was no difference in what I saw. <laughs> because it turns out that I am what is considered a strong protan. My cone cells are exceptionally impaired. They don't detect enough red. They're too sensitive to oranges and greens and yellows, and in short, the glasses don't work for me. I guess what I'm saying is, Please stop sending me links <laughs> to those videos. And I ask this not because I'm upset, but because, quite frankly, I don't need those glasses. Even though what you see and what I see might be different, isn't it powerful to understand that all that's really going on is just a difference in our interpretations of the same thing? Perspective is relative. It would be easy for me to be upset to claim that I'm the victim of some sort of biological injustice. But that would just be a story I'd be telling myself, and stories are powerful. While stories aren't fact, they can impact how we view the world and how we interpret the hands that life has dealt us. Stories, like genetics and language, can shape our perspectives. And knowing all this now, I'm excited for whatever's next. I'm a writer by trade, but maybe I'll take a page out of Uncle Kurt's book and I'll pick up wood carving. <laughs> maybe I'll even start wearing suspenders, burgundy ones, <laughs> because that would be bold mm -hmm. and stylish. And while I really can't be sure as to what's in store, I am certain of two things. And that's one, I am not going to get into ventriloquism. because that still scares me more than ever. <laughs> and two, like Uncle Kurt, I'm going to continue to celebrate my unique perspective because it's okay that the grass isn't greener on the other side. I'm thrilled with that grass being just as reddish <laughs> or brownish as it's ever been. Thanks. <laughs>